You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you further. You step forward little by little, not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Deeper Waters podcast. I'm Nick Peters, your host, seeking to bring you the very best in Christian scholarship and apologetics. And today, we're still talking about marriage. And why am I doing this? Because I'm convinced that if we're going to win the battle for marriage, which is important for us to be winning, we need to be living marriage. I think we need to realize that if a church, the church, the world is trying to disrespect marriage, it's probably because the church did it first. I mean, I realize Shanti Feldhorn's research into the myth of divorce amongst churchgoers and such. Yes, but we still have problems, and even if we're not, like, right on the verge of divorce or something, our marriages could always use some tune-ups. And this time, I've got a husband and wife on together to talk about this. It's been a while since we've done something like this, I think. Maya and Kay Yorkovich were the last ones we had on talking about this kind of topic. But we've got two different bloggers here at our husband and wife team talking about marriage. It's Paul and Lori Byerly. Paul runs a blog called The XY Code, helping women understand men. Now, from my perspective, I think we are not that hard to understand. But (laughs) (laughs) I, I enjoy it for most men. It's Food, sports, sex, one of those, you're in, okay? Although, Grant, only one of, a, one of those three works on me. For, for Lori, she writes, The Generous Wife. What kind of wives do Christian women need to be? So I'd like to welcome both of them here to the show. Uh, Paul, Lori, good to have both of you here. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got to be doing what you all are doing here? Um, years ago we had, uh, well, we got married and we just had a lot of messes and we didn't know where to go for help. We, we looked around and couldn't find much and basically ended up, you know, praying and crying and stumbling through it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And about halfway through, I think I'm going to blame it on Paul. He prayed and he said, Lord, if we ever survive this, help us to help others. And that became websites and blogs and other ministry over the years. Okay, and uh, how long have you all been married? 33 years, a couple days ago. Mm-hmm. Nice. When, when was the big day? Oh, my, he's going to ask me. I'm not the number person, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess January 27th That's of right. 85. Yeah. Nice, nice. And so, Lori, I, I, I can tell since I hear him speaking that you haven't cured him yet. <laughs> <laughs> I talk more than she does. Actually, he's the extrovert, but for some reason, when we get to being mute or doing any teaching or something, I end up doing a fair amount of the talking. She's smarter, so I let her talk. Oh. <laughs> Usually, my wife's the one who makes remarks about having a baseball bat under the bed and such. I, 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 oh. I, I suppose it's to, just in case we have intruders coming in during the night or something. You know, she, right. she wants to stay safe. Has nothing to me, <laughs> nothing to do with me being extra annoying at times or anything like that. <laughs> so, I mean, what kind of messes were you having? Because, you know, we hear about marriages and, you know, you get married and all of a sudden life's a fairy tale from that, go, that point on. And, you know, it, it's like a Disney story. I mean, what kind of things can go wrong? Oh, wow. Um, I had a, a quite a history of abuse. I was sexually abused as a kid. Grew up in kind of a messy family was acquaintance raped in college and then sort of on the rebound uh, made a very bad marriage choice that ended in divorce seven years later. So when I met and married Paul, I just had a history of mess. Mm-hmm. And and I think also just growing up in a messy family, you don't learn good relational skills. You don't learn how to be a good wife or a good friend or anything else like mm-hmm. that. I'll let- I, I had a 
deep history with porn. Now, I'd been clean mm. a good eight years married. I mean, I got out very young, but I'd seen an awful lot at a young age, and I didn't realize till later how much that had affected me. I mean, even though I wasn't looking anymore, it was in my head. And so, you know, the way I like to put it is she was covered in gasoline, and I was playing with matches, and it was only a matter of time mm. before something went wrong. Yeah, and something else that you all have said has gone wrong in a relationship, uh, you said on someone's blog, is that you all didn't wait until you were married to have sex. That's true. And I, I think what that did for us personally, and perhaps many couples, is it, it, it feels like a break in trust. Mm-hmm. Um, you may not acknowledge it yourself, but it's like you're not waiting, you're not cherishing, you're not caring it also throws your relationship on the fast track intimacy wise. Mm. And you may not think things through carefully. If you have premarital counseling, you may not address the problems as readily because you've already made the choice. You're sexual, you're in, you're, you're getting married and, and it all just kind of blurs together. You know, she will never know that I would have married her if we weren't having sex. I think she yeah. believes that now happened. Yeah. But she can't know that. Um, the other piece of that, because she felt, I mean, she was willing. She was, you know, mm-hmm. as engaged as I was, but she felt more wrong about it than I did. Mm-hmm. And that made it more difficult for her to say, well, yeah, I like this and I don't like that or I don't want to do this. You know, when you're already cross the line, it's hard to say no to anything. And so we got a false start on sexuality and eventually had to go back and sort of restart from the beginning. Yeah. And I, I think also I carry probably a heavier load of guilt. And it's like, if you feel guilty about sex, then it's harder to approach sex mm. after you're married. And yeah. so it's, it's kind of like extra weight that hurts your sexuality. Yeah. I mean, Bob, I'm curious if you were kind of thinking the same kind of way, because usually in today's society, like if you watch a sitcom or anything like that, it's as soon as you have sex with a girl, I mean, you go off, you get high fives from all your friends and such, like, congratulations, but mm-hmm. was what was it for you? I mean, was there any of that, or was it more like, dang, I made a mistake? Um, we were, you know, we were trying to follow the Lord, we were active in church, we sort of convinced ourselves it was okay, because that's what we wanted, I mean, me more than her, so... <laughs> yeah. It was it was it was a very you know we weren't telling anybody because yeah. we knew the people around us wouldn't approve you know rightly so so no there was no no one knew it was it was very much a private thing. Now let, let's uh, talk some about the difference some of the differences here between men and women because usually I mean there's no doubt for me a man's mind since it definitely happened with me as well once you have sex with that woman it does kind of bond a commitment there that. The love level yeah. just shoots straight up from that point on. But I don't think it's the same for men and women in the same way that men can much more easily detach themselves. If I have a romantic time with my wife in the afternoon, I can be doing things just fine in the evening and have a good memory of the day. But it doesn't mean I'm going to be you know, being doing everything with her and such. And I think my wife probably wouldn't respond the same way. As I would. I mean, it, what do you all think? Well, hormonally, you know, biochemically, yes, the women are more affected. Um, there's a hormone called oxytocin, which is released during sex, any kind of touch, but sex is particularly good for that. Yeah. And women are more sensitive to oxytocin than men. Um, it's got something to do with testosterone. So she is more affected by that. They call it the bonding uh, hormone Yeah. Uh, than I am. And there are other, there are a variety of other things that definitely are different between men and women in how we biochemically respond to sex. Uh-huh. Wait, what what do I, you think? I think I think our world has taught us that men and women are are fairly similar. And if you you take the time to read a lot of books about brain development and the differences between genders, uh, there there are some pretty significant ones and. One of them is, is more of my brain is, has, in, like in utero especially, and then again at puberty, more of my brain is given over to things that are very relational. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about women having intuition. It, yeah. It's really more about more of their brain being given over to things like voice nuance, facial expression. Yeah language and so we pick up on relational things really really fast and far more easily than the guys Um, more of our brain is geared toward relations so you know you have sex once with a man you're you're in 
Um, you're very uh, connected and, and you're going to be far more determined to make that relationship work. And that's why we ask, we encourage people not to have sex before a marriage because that locks you in before you've really thought through some really important things. You know, do you have common values? Do you have a common a view on life? All these things. And if you've had sex, you're in, you're married, and then suddenly you realize you have some significant issues that should have been addressed before you said I do to make sure the I do was something you wanted for life. You know, something that you were saying there kind of reminds me about things that happen in our marriage. My wife is much more prone to me. I think she's the only one prone. If she's one of the she says, hey, let's just sit down and talk together. For me, that makes no sense whatsoever (laughs) because unless there's some factual thing we need to discuss, some information we needed to get out, I don't understand okay. the point of talking. I mean, it's me, I mean, I'm wondering, let's turn on t- TV, let's see what's on, let's turn on YouTube, let's see if there's any videos we want to watch, anything like that. But just, let's just sit down and talk. I mean, um, it's kind of like, am, am well, I in trouble? Did I do something wrong? What? <laughs> no, the, the thing is, is, the probability is that more of her brain is geared to verbal communication yep. as well. And, yeah. And so you do have two very different people who have to kind of negotiate how they communicate and work together. Yeah. Paul, can you relate to any of that? Uh, I'm unusual. I'm much more verbal than most men. So I'm somewhere in between a normal woman and a normal uh, man, which I think helps me get a better perspective on it. Yeah, I, I, but yeah, men, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, you know, men in general are far less verbal. Um, mm. You know, you see it when guys are together. I tell the story, you know, I walk into the hardware store I've never been to before, and I say, eye bolts. And the male clerk says, aisle six. And we have just had a full conversation. Yeah. Whereas if I go in, I explain the project I'm working on and how I'm making this cute little birdhouse, and I need some some of this or some of that. And he'll walk me down the aisle and show me where it is, and we have a much fuller conversation. I mean, And if he's a good salesman, he knows that I need to have that, you know. Mm. So, yeah, it's a very different world. Yeah, one way I'm thinking about for me is, for instance, my parents live about four hours away from us. We're in Georgia, they're in Tennessee, and... My mother wishes I'd call more often, which I keep saying, yeah, I will, I will, I will. And you know how that goes. But she call me, oh, how are you doing? Fine. Anything going on? <laughs> no. Is I okay? Yeah. Hey, well, good to talk to you. You too. And to me, we've just had a conversation at that point, And I, I keep telling her, Mom, well, I'm likely not going to call you unless I have some information I want to convey. Then, or some question I want to ask, then I will call you. I will very likely not call you just to call you. Right. Oh. That sounds pretty normal. There's also a study I've seen before that when women communicate usually, women, mm-hmm. if they're in person, assuming all this, women will communicate face to face, talk to each other that way. Men were sit side by side looking the same way, and they talk that way. Right. Um, I've also seen where if guys are doing something together side by side, conversation is a little bit easier. And so I encourage women to invite their husband to go for a walk because then you're Mm -hmm. walking side by side, and it's a little Mm -hmm. easier for the guy. Or if he's working on the car, go sit out there and hand him tools while he's working and talk Mm -hmm. to him then. And that just makes it a little easier on the guys to communicate. Let's talk some about your blogs, too. Lori, you've got the generous wife. What's the point, mm-hmm. in, your, what's the point in your blog? What would you say you're aiming to do with that? Um, I'm, I'm aiming to be just a very gentle drip, drip, drip mm-hmm. um, in somebody's inbox. I want to remind them daily that it's just the little things that you do that build your marriage. Yes, big gestures are nice and all that, but if you will be routinely kind, thoughtful, generous, you can significantly impact your marriage, grow mm-hmm. your marriage. Mm-hmm. And, and that started, well, just some stuff that the Lord taught me. I'm, I mentioned that I grew up in kind of a messy family. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to be a wife. And I, when I went looking for help, couldn't find much. And so I just said, Lord, teach me about, you know, what, what do I need to know? And one of the first things God seemed to drop in my head was generosity. And so I prayed and practiced and learned, and it made a really significant difference 
in our marriage. And mm. so one the lark, I decided, oh, I need to have a blog. Mm. <laughs> and so it just started with the tiniest. I mean, I think my first emails were like two or three sentences. Mm. And then over time, you know, I got to write a little better and share other resources and whatnot. But just to to help women be intentional and focused mm. on doing the little things day in and day out that will grow their marriage. Of course, I'm the techie, so I had to put the blog together for her. Uh-huh. And I thought, well, as long as she's doing it, I should do it too. So the generous husband, my other blog, started at the same time as the generous wife. Mm-hmm. And then the ex code came years later. Mm-hmm. Now, wait, what are the mo- biggest mistakes in that case that you think women are making in their marriage? Um, I think one of the big ones, and I think culturally it's true of both genders, is we expect our husband to be like us. Mm-hmm. And this is, I feel this is what I think. This is how I do things. He's doing something different. You know, it, it, it we, we misunderstand their motivations because we think they are like us. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that's why it's so important to ask questions and have those hard discussions. Things like, uh, what does respect look like to you? Well, respect looks something different to me. And I'm doing all these yeah. things that I think like respect. And my husband still doesn't feel it because I'm not doing the things that speak respect to him. Yeah. I think also uh, kind of similarly related when you have expectations and you don't voice them, you're asking your spouse to go into the marriage blind. Yeah. Now, sometimes you don't even realize you have those expectations, but when you find yourself routinely disappointed, it's time to sit down and say, what is it that I'm blue over? What is it I'm expecting and, and have some talks uh, about what you value and what you need. So, talk, you know, manipulation, hinting, all those things, those are out. Be plain and simple and clear uh, about what you feel, what you think, what you need and want. There's, there's a lot of hinting going along, on with women. It's, it's sort of a, a thing you're taught culturally. And it, it really puts your marriage at a disadvantage, puts your husband as a di- at a disadvantage. Because he feels very clueless. He doesn't know what's going on because you haven't clearly communicated. And I think also, currently, yeah, but usually women. I think, honestly, there's a war on men in our country today. That masculinity is something looked down on and such. I mean, you turn on any sitcom, you can see what most men are like in the media. And that many women seem to think their men are just insensitive, lazy perverts who just think about sex and nothing yeah. else. Yeah, I I think I came in with the women's lib and a bunch of gender kind of war sort of things. We have disrespected what it is to really be a man Mm -hmm. and to understand the value of the things that masculine men bring to the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, we risk takers. We need uh, strength. We need a lot of the things that come with masculinity. Mm -hmm. We've seen it misused. And so we tend to disregard it, put it down, push it away. But I think we need to pay attention, especially to the men who are doing it well, and then Mm -hmm. point to them and say, this is masculinity. This is good. Don't, you know, don't fall to the, to the, to the bad side, but look at what good can be done with masculine strengths and masculine characteristics. Mm-hmm. Pa, I mean, what do you think? Do you think that society generally looks down on men today? And do you, do you agree with what your wife said about how wives sometimes don't realize they're disrespecting their husbands? Yeah, absolutely. Because we think differently and we assume, you know, he thinks the way I do. And that's a huge piece of the problem in in a lot of the the problems in marriage. And then, you you know, you've got a male culture and a female culture. I mean, we we intermix quite a bit, but there's definitely, you know, the women get together to talk. They have, you know, certain shows they prefer, certain things they discuss. We do the same thing with men. And so that reads these, the, the female story about men, which may not have a whole lot to do with what men really are or with people who've interacted with men on a, on a real basis. So it just creates this mythology, basically, that gets perpetuated. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there is some truth to the whole myth. I mean, men do think differently. And yes, like I said, sex is usually on the forefront of our minds pretty often. Right. I mean, I, I've heard the statistic that a man usually thinks about sex every seven seconds. And my reply is, really? It takes them that long? And, <laughs> and women 
just don't think that way, and that's something we men don't really understand. Oh. Yeah, that's another place where we assume that, you know, we assume women are like us. They think about it all the time, they want it all the time, and that assumption gets us in big trouble. Yeah. And I think um, one of the, the healthy things I've been seeing a lot of the blogs that talk about sexuality is they're, they're beginning to talk more about gender differences. Mm -hmm. And not that one is right and the other wrong, but rather that they are both good, they're just different. And they bring something good to the, each brings something good to the table. It's like, yes, we need the masculine drive for physical acts of sex. We of intimate relationship. And if you lean into both of those together, you can have a very balanced, healthy, happy marriage. Can, can you mention both of the things you need to give or we, we cut out for a little bit there? Oh, okay. No, I was talking about men and women bring different things to the table. And it's like God gave a, a guys a really strong physical drive because yeah. he wants people to enjoy this beautiful gift. Mm. At the same time, bring this hunger for relationship and intimacy. And and that is a good thing too. And so I guess what I'm saying is value both and make room for both. and You'll have a healthier relationship. You know, let's talk a little bit about the respect thing again. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things that women get wrong with respect is they don't realize that men I think tend to be leaders. And mm -hmm. when a man like feels like his wife is leading him in some ways, like mm -hmm. how he needs to be doing things and such, he automatically feels disrespected. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is this is going to have to be sort of ongoing conversation because mm -hmm. you have two adults in a relationship and they both need to be heard and valued. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you need to explore your differences so that the wife understands his heart to lead mm -hmm. and his need to be heard and valued. So it's mm -hmm. it's... It's rather like a dance, and it yeah. starts when you get married, and it goes your whole life, trying to hear each other's hearts and mm -hmm. what you need to be seen and heard and valued. And they're going to be a little bit different here and there because of gender differences. And you know, what you're talking about, I, you know, I greatly value Lori's input. Um, mm -hmm. Most of my decisions are better if I have her input as part of what you know my thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way she approaches me makes a big difference. I mean, she yeah. can say. Basically the same thing, two different ways. And the first one is, you know, I, I feel good about it. You know, I want to, I want to explore it. And the other one feels like she's telling me I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. And that's not, yeah, it's gender differences. That, and part of that is I have to learn, okay, I know that's not what she believes about me. So if I come up that way, you know, I'll usually push back a little bit and, and try and get past that. And then she's learned, you know, how to approach me so that I don't feel that way. Yeah. I, I think when Again, it's, go, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I think it comes from ongoing conversation. If I said something to Paul, I'd want him to tell me that feels very disrespectful. Yeah. And and we'll talk about why. Sometimes it's gender differences. Sometimes it's because the families we grew up in. Like, if you yell at me, that feels so hugely disrespectful. But there's some families that yell and carry on, and it's very normal and okay. Yeah. And so we had to have ongoing conversations with the What's disrespectful? What's not? What do I need from you? What not? And and it's like I love Paul. I don't want to ever dishonor or disrespect him, and he knows that. And so the ongoing conversation is to help us continue to communicate in a way that feels respectful to both of us. I, I think I can give you a real. Go ahead. I can give you a real life example of this. Uh, we were in uh, Denver, and we were actually going on our way to speak at a marriage conference. And we go out, we're getting to go out, leaving the hotel room. And she says something about the length of my pants. Now she's concerned, you know, about how I look, that's fine. But because of my past, you know, and some stuff growing up with my mother, what I heard was, is you're so stupid. You don't know how to dress yourself, yeah. which is not what she said. That's how I interpreted it. And when we proceeded to have a half hour discussion, not about the length of my pants, but about you know, all the stuff it had triggered. And and we've done this long enough that we, it's the real issue. We dug down, we solved it. You know, we went, we were able to talk decently and not be angry at each other while talking about marriage, which is a bad thing. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I find that well, one pretty yeah, interesting. I find that one pretty interesting curse for me. I mean, in our marriage, some of that listeners were showing us, my wife and I both have Asperger's. Mm -hmm. So I can be one who's kind of out okay. of it 
and disconnected sometimes. And so we're be it going up and down the steps. She's falling behind me. We live in an apartment complex. And she's like, oh, you need to fix your pants. Like, oh, okay. Because I would never have noticed otherwise because my brain just doesn't work that way. But for you, Paul, apparently it does something. <laughs> well, it, it tends to function that way, not as much as hers. And partly it, it tapped into something my mother had done to me. And well, that's huge. Most of us are still, you know, getting over what our parents did or didn't do to us. And we don't realize that. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't even think we talk about what effect our mothers have. But there was a story about a student who went to college, and he was studying psychology, and he was uh, learning about Freudian slips and such. So he came home for Thanksgiving to with his family, and he had one of his mother. He meant to say, please pass the salt, but instead he said, you ruined my life, you horrid woman! <laughs> um, are you... You still with us, Nick? Yeah, I like everyone now. We're we're having some technical difficulties. They're actually talking to us from a Wi-Fi spot at a coffee shop in their car. So that's why things right. can be <laughs> awful. But yeah, and that, right. you, you, you're sorry right about the way our parents can influence us before we go into marriage. Right, and it, it, that's again, that's another thing to discuss that's going to make your marriage unique. Just like I talked about, you know, yelling feels horribly disrespectful. Paul needs to know that. Mm, yeah. uh, because in his heart, he doesn't want to disrespect me. So, you know, that's something that's off the table for him. Anyway. Unfortunately, I didn't come from a family of yellers. If I had, that would have been a very difficult thing for me to learn a new way of communicating. Yeah, for me, I came from a family where, where we all speak sarcasm fluently. Uh, My wife mm-hmm. hates it when I use it on her, though, at the same time, which mm. is very hard for us. Here. And we, we had a time that uh, when we were living with ne- closer to our family, we went to see my aunt one day. She was our neighbor then and how are you was saying, I, I, I just don't understand this whole family. Everyone is just so sarcastic here. And my aunt said, well, that's the way we are. As we've always talked, but we don't mean it. And I was reason I just looked up and said, we don't? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think another way we're talking about that being that wives don't realize sometimes they're being disrespectful to their husbands and such, because this is a common one that comes up is wives often complain sometimes, why doesn't he help me around the house of cleaning up and things like that? So a husband decides he's gonna do he's gonna go and do the dishes. So he goes and he does the dishes, and what happens? She tells him everything he did wrong. And yeah. the husband usually gets a message, not gonna do that one again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's that's kind of similar is when you ask your spouse to do something and they don't know how. Yeah. And and so that's that's sort of a recipe. I will do my best and I won't do it right and I'll get complained out and I'll never do it again. Mm-hmm. And that's that's something I've seen that's been addressed on my blog and several other lady bloggers who do marriage things. And just and that you're right. That is that is a form of disrespect. And it, again, it's it's the. You know, neither right nor wrong, just different and making room for differences. Uh, if my husband wants to put the dishes in the dishwashers different than what I would do, it, it's not wrong. It's just different. As long and, as they come out clean. Yeah. 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 That's all we men think about. And, and that's, that's um, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to see this on some of the, the lady bloggers because uh, we really do need to pass down to younger women, a more respectful and more kind demeanor toward their husbands. You can speak truth. You can even speak hard truth, but do so kindly and respectfully. Of course, I've, I've seen men do it too. You know, it's the guy who goes in and completely rearranges the spices because his method makes more sense. Yeah. Only he doesn't use a spice. She yeah. does all the cooking. So he's basically said, my way that doesn't work for you is more than you'll have to live with it. So yeah. it's not just women who do it. We just do it in a different way. You know, something that you said... But also got me thinking that no reason this affects men so much is we men, we like to try new things, but we're not going to try something if we're pretty darn sure we're going to fail at it or we can't do it. I mean, I am, sorry, not going to get, get out and try professional golfing anytime soon, for instance, because I know <laughs> I will fail at it. So if a man approaches with dishes and he thinks he's going to fail and he's not good enough and his wife gives him that impression, 
Well, guess what? He's not going to try. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I was so grateful to this. We were speaking at a small conference and this guy explained that perspective to me. And, and I had not heard it where, you know, if, if you've been set up to fail, you don't know enough to do the job that that's sort of a recipe for not doing anything at all. I mean, who wants to try and fail? Yeah. And so that, that was something I really try and hit when I, when I talk to like and explain to them, make room for your husband and his differences. And they're, they're just as valid as yours. One way a woman can deal with that, you know, the dishes is the example. Okay, say, you know, I can use a hand with dishes, but you dry. Okay, yeah. that's, it's hard to mess up drying. I mean, either it's wet or it's not. <laughs> but then he's watching her do it, and so he can learn mm-hmm. by watching her without her saying, you know, I'm going to teach you how to wash dishes. Yep. Mm-hmm. And later he'll be able to wash, you know. And <laughs> you know, Lori, uh, also, isn't there a benefit also to a man doing this? My wife shared with me a very hysterical video the other day about how differences men and women were different. First part, how to turn a man on. Pretty much, a woman wa- walks into a bedroom wearing something <laughs> skimpy. The man's already ready. And then next, how to turn uh-huh. a woman on. It has this woman just sitting on the couch doing something. All of a sudden, she looks up and her husband's washing the dishes, and she's just sitting there transfixed the whole time. <laughs> and then he's vacuuming. He's like, "Oh gosh!" <laughs> or or uh, <laughs> cleaning out the toilet in the bathroom and. <laughs> and yeah, we, we men can benefit if we do these kinds of things, can't we? Yeah. Well, I, I think what what really I it would it would help every spouse to learn their spouse's love language. Yeah. And like I'm an active of service person. If Paul mows the yard, I know he loves me. Okay. Yeah. yeah that kind of thing. Um, I think people just want to be seen and known and loved and appreciated. And when you do whatever that is that speaks that to them, then you one kind of love and intimacy makes it easier for you to move into another. And so when you speak acts of service or, or you know, speak kind words to somebody who's a word of affirmation person, then you open the door to uh, sexual intimacy or I, I like even other kinds of things like intellectual intimacy, like mm-hmm. when you're learning things together, then you have a common language or there's there's a number of ways, just all areas of your life where you you build a sameness, uh, an intimacy, and that bleeds into the others. And it, it's all good. You know, my wife's love language is gifts. And ah. for me... It's words of affirmation and physical touch, which the last one really surprised me because normally I can't stand anyone else touching me. But if it's her, it's all good. And uh-huh. I mean, I know it used to be when I lived at home with my parents and I was definitely single then. When Mother's Day was coming around and such, I'd spend a couple of hours or so at the mall going to every single store trying to find the perfect gift. And every now and then, when I stopped at a gas station on the way home, every now and then, every time, I might do something like buy a rose and bring it home to my mother and such. And she'd say, Nick, whenever you get married, you are going to spoil your wife rotten. Well, that <laughs> prophecy has kind of come true and nice. such. And I got, our anniversary is July 24th. I tell you, yep, we have our anniversary on July 24th. I start planning the next one on July 25th. And <laughs> doing everything I can to go all out for her. And oh. it, it, people who've seen my Facebook know that uh, I don't post on Sundays, but every other day of the week, I post some marriage meme. And then I post some message of love to my wife. Every day. Just pairing things up. And... Okay. The, the, the whole thing with gifts is just because we were at the mall yesterday and she said, I still haven't got you anything for Valentine's Day. And I said, um, honey, uh, buy me a gift for Valentine's Day. Isn't exactly what it would mean the most to me there. But, you know, she still wanted to buy me something. And so we did go to the uh, Faint Geek store and managed <laughs> to find some, uh, some Legend of Zelda posters. I said, okay, that will do it for me, then. Just something small. <laughs> we didn't have much. I didn't want to spend a lot, but I want to say, okay, we got something. And, I mean, it for, for her, something like that would mean so much. For me, it's, well, okay. But if I go and give her a compliment, it doesn't mean the same thing. Or if I do any physical touch, it doesn't mean the same thing. But if she does post me, like, oh, she's got my attention right there. Yeah, that's the, the great wisdom of understanding what your spouse's love language is. Mm-hmm. 
Now, Paul Yuva got the XY code, helping women to understand men and such. And as I started, said, usually for men, we're pretty simple. You just go food, sports, sex, some combination thereof or such. Usually one of those three will get you in the door. So it would seem like we're pretty easy to understand, but what is so hard to understand about us? Well, again, it's the fact that we look at each other and say, you must be like me. So yep. women expect their husband to be like them. The, the hinting, she wants you to do such and such, but she won't ask you, she kind of hints. And yep. every one of her girlfriends would get the hint and follow through. Yeah. And we just completely miss it because we're not, you know, our brains are not designed to pick up on those little nuances. Right. Right. She gets hurt because, you know, you don't care about me. You didn't do such and such. And I'm like, well, you never asked me to do such and such. And she says, well, if I have to ask you, it doesn't count. Then I'm confused because how am I supposed to know what to do? So it's a lot of assumptions that get us in trouble. Yeah, we, and it, go ahead, Lori. Um, some in, innate things like he talks about uh, a man's need to sort of find his limits and to work and, and pretty much uh, sort of the expression of testosterone and what it does to a guy and uh, because I, ha I have like zero interest in in super risky behaviors or anything like that yeah and and it, it, you question your spouse's sanity it's just like <laughs> why would you want to do that and he helps uh, explain some of those differences in terms that hopefully women can understand. Yeah. You know, when you were talking about guys getting hints and such, uh, mm -hmm. Sheila Ray Gregora had something on a blog about 10 tips to let your husband know tonight that you're going to be getting lucky tonight and such. <laughs> and I would said, I love this, I'm going to comment, I said, ladies, honestly, here's the best way to do it. Just go out and say it because men seldomly catch hints whatsoever. Right. I, I know my right. wife was saying, I saw him read to me and said, well, I know you said there have been two times that you were really in the mood and you were hearing it to me and I was completely oblivious to it. I said, actually, there were three. Three? Three. <laughs> well, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to go and cry now and think about those three times and wish I could have gone back and seen <laughs> what was going on and such. Because, I mean, we, we miss those hints. We do not understand them. Right. Well, and we're also afraid to to follow up on them because yeah. what a lot of women don't realize is, yes, they do those things where they're hinting, but she may also do it when she's not hinting. Right. I think men look at women and just see them as just beautiful and sexy and anything that their wife does is, is yep. sort of an expression of that. And so how do you know the difference between that and when she's trying to hint? I, I, I am all for simple, straightforward, honest communication. Tell, tell your spouse what they, what you want. You know, I think part of what Paul is saying also, I mean, you'd agree with this, Lori, as well, is that a lot of men don't follow through some of them. They think the hint's coming because men fear rejection just as much as women do many times. And if we get shot down by our wives in our minds, it's like, well, geez, I must not be much of a man. I mean, women, I don't think, just don't realize how much the whole masculinity thing plays into us. Yeah, and sex is really uh, a big deal there. You know, if, yeah. if, if I say you want to play Scrabble and she says no, that's not a big deal. If I say, do you want to have sex? And she says, no, that's a whole lot more of a big oh, deal. Yeah. That's, that's not feels, just, I'd kind of like to, that's putting myself on the line. Yeah, it's a very, it feels like very personal rejection. Mm -hmm. I get that. Mm -hmm. and and me, that's, meanwhile, a woman usually don't think is saying, oh, right now, I, I, I just got my hair done, or I, I'm tired of my clean. I, and she's not thinking anything personal, but he is. I, I, at this point, I'd kind of like to um, really encourage any of your women listeners to read some of the, if you go to The Generous Wife, I point to a number of, of bloggers, and they talk about married sexuality from a Christian perspective. And mm. I'd, I'd love to encourage women to study and know what God says about married sexuality and to enjoy it and invite their husband into that kind of intimacy. There are a couple of really good courses. You mentioned Sheila Gregor. She has a libido course, and there's another one called Awaken Love, and you'll find these on uh, The Generous Wife and, you know, do searches. And these are gals who have a heart to help women understand what a precious gift sex and marriage is and how important it is to their husband and to the, the intimacy, overall intimacy, that they have in their marriage. 
I'd also want to advertise uh, Jay Parker's material on hot, holy, and humorous. She's been on our show before talking about that, and <laughs> she's got a Facebook community set up for people who are married to talk about these kinds of issues. Um, you know, yeah, she's a double. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jay is excellent. Yeah, or one other thing you'd about when you'd about how important it is to men is a uh, I'm a game show junkie. My wife doesn't understand it, but I am. You know, I turn on TV, she's like, "You're watching Family Feud again?" It's like, <laughs> yeah, I am. And on that network, they show mainly the ones with Steve Harvey hosting, and he has a question. He says, "We asked one married men this: Fear of a blank? I would blank for sex." And one of the guys wings in immediately, <laughs> says, pay. It's the number <laughs> one answer right there. And Steve goes and says, it's a sad, sad statement about married men. And it's so completely yeah. true. <laughs> and then they go to two women on family, cook, clean, eh, not up there, not there. Next man says, I would lie, lie. Yep, that's up there. Beg, that's up there, men. Kill and oh, wow. y- yeah, and but the, the last one up and he gets to women, goes in the, and gets to the next woman, and he says, Okay, every family, get ready for a chance to steer. And gets keeps saying, This is a guy question, I mean, you women, you don't know how deep this runs with us. I mean, all those things about list pay, lie, beg, kill, and the last one was die. I, I, I can imagine oh. many men who would easily say any one of those answers. Yeah, it's, it's it's a whole different universe. Yeah, um, the women. Well, uh, what can, do you so, think a wife can expect from her husband if, in this area, though, she is keeping him happy? How will how will life be different then? Um, I think you get a clearer window yeah. into his heart and who he is. Yeah. Because if he's always having to lie, steal, cheat, whatever, to get sex, if he doesn't have to do that, you know, he's not always spending time and energy trying to get sex it's it's a very easily received gift yeah. then you find out who he really is and typically it opens him up to other forms of intimacy yeah. for the most part uh, it's like a guy is so hungry for sex physically that he can't really see or feel the other kinds of intimacy yeah and it, so if you fill that up, then suddenly it's like, this is the woman he loves. Yeah, yeah of course he'll go for a walk. Of course yeah. he'll do this. Of course he'll do this. And it, it's just such um, I don't mean it to sound bad, but it's kind of a nag for him physically. Always mm-hmm. the draw. You know, I, I yeah. need sex. I want sex. And if, if that can be taken care of, then all the other kinds of intimacy come into focus. So. I, I read hard, go ahead. I read an article in a uh, secular women's magazine, so this is not Christian, but this woman decided, I mean, they've been married a dozen years, had a couple kids, she decided, okay, I'm going to have sex with my husband every day for a month. Didn't tell him, just started doing it, and she said by the end of the first week, he was a completely different person, mm-hmm. you know, he was, he was more attentive, he was, you know, oh, the garage needs to clean out, oh, what, where do you want to go for dinner? Yeah. Just because he was no longer struggling with that, and the the love and gratitude he felt, because she was now you know, covering what he needed mm-hmm. made a huge difference in his behavior. You know, Paul, I, I think that uh, what me and women don't realize is this great desire that we have many times. We would love to be able to flip that off switch every now and then. <laughs> so it's just not driving us so much. But unfortunately, it is. I have I wrote a blog once about this is a man's world. And I gave an example because we used to go to a church that met at a mall. It met in a movie theater there. We get after church one day and Allie's doing some with some of the other people there. I decided to go out walking my mall some. And I'm walking, and here comes a girl who's heading my way. I mean, she's not heading towards me, but she's heading my way. And she's a rather attractive one, so I do what every good guy does at this point. Look away. And what's right there but Victoria's Secret <laughs> at that point? And as I say, yeah, this is the world a man lives in. And then there's a there of all these businesses, advertising, and there's a spa there. Like, I'll go and I'll see if, you know, we don't have much money, but maybe I can do a, something a little small for out and such. And so there was an advertisement with a girl who's wearing very little covering uh, herself. And it's just an upper body photo and such. And I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, I can still remember seeing these things to this day because that's the way we men are, unfortunately. I, I often tell women, say, like, if you want to know what it is like for a man, just picture this. Picture being on a diet and wanting to lose those last 10 or 20 pounds or however much it is and having to go to the grocery store and go through the ice cream section or the chocolate section or cookie section, whichever section it is, you women know which one it is for you. Picture having to go through that session. That is a world we men live in every day when we're surrounded by women who are just trying to look their best, not because they're out there trying to get us to slip and fail, but because they're women. Women, they like to be beautiful. We live in that world all day long, and then too often for a man, he comes home, he's had to say no, 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 all day, he gets home where yes is a possible answer, and eh, no. I, I think, again, this is why so many of the, the bloggers are out there are so important, yeah. because they're, they're trying to help women understand what's really important in a relationship, I one of the things that Paula and I nag about a lot is that we're all too busy and we don't have time for our relationships. And you need time and energy for your spouse. And I, I think there is a, a growing awareness within the church of how precious sex is to a married couple. And we're having better and healthier teaching about it. It used to be the church didn't say anything about sex or they just said don't, you know, or whatever. And now I think we're seeing that so that when the husband does come home, he knows that his home is a sex friendly place, that he enjoys sex and so does his wife. And that when he goes out, it is far less of a temptation. And I'm not saying that the wife is responsible for what her husband does or doesn't do, but she can simply make his world easier. Another piece of that talked about our desire to, you know, to see. And I talked to guys and, you know, they're having a decent sex life. They can't complain about the frequency, but they haven't seen their wife fully naked in years. Yeah. You know, she comes to bed in a baggy T-shirt. She changes clothes. In the, and I understand women, you know, body issue is just huge. Most women are, are terrified that they're, you know, ugly and, scar, and they're going to scar people if, if, you know, if their husband sees them naked. We don't care. I mean, yeah. that's not. We want to see the woman we love yeah. naked. And we know she, you know, has had babies and has stretch marks and all the rest of that. That's not what we see. When she's yeah. naked, we don't see stretch marks. We don't see, you know, the extra weight. We don't see whatever that she sees looking in the mirror. Yeah. And and men get hungry for that. And guys, even if they're having a, a fair amount of sex with their wife, if they're not able to enjoy her body by seeing it, that's a problem. And it causes, you know, struggles and temptations. I know that's a struggle. For my own wife, she's got some weight issues and such. And like, how can you look at me and see someone beautiful? Is it because, baby, I see you and you right. are beautiful. And the more we've been married, you have become my idea of beauty. And, and I would do, I mean, a, a man would pretty much do anything for a chance to see his wife naked. Right. <laughs> Hopefully, not die. No. <laughs> well, well, Lori, well, Lori, doesn't this just demonstrate, though, that all we men are are just a bunch of perverts? I mean, all we do is think about sex. Aren't we just perverts? No, because I think, again, you have this is not right or wrong. This is different. And God has, if you, if you look at it, guys are kind of testosterone machines mm-hmm. and women are relational machines. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they're coming together. It can be really amazing. But we have to make room for each other's differences and value those things. Not, not, because our world does help guys and gals pervert their gifts and their strengths. Yeah. But, but to value the original design. I mean, mm-hmm. God did give men a stronger physical drive because he wants that yeah. pull to physical intimacy fairly often. Yeah. And, and I, so it's it's like, no, that doesn't make you a pervert. That makes you a man. And that's good and healthy and right. I think it's really important for a wife to tell her husband, no, I don't think you're a monster. No, I don't think you're a sexual pervert. And, and you know, I want to honor your masculinity and the drive you have. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times that when it, what women don't often realize is, I mean, I hate to say it, but if sex wasn't in, wasn't something that was part of a marriage deal, Men would never get married to begin with. I mean, mm-hmm. we, why would we take someone into our lives that we are be spending so much money on, someone who's dependent on us without any benefit towards the man of a relationship? 
Yeah, I think there are a number of masculine things that sort of get passed over in our culture. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I think also somewhere, and this is something I was just thinking, and I don't remember what in our talk, but I think there is at the heart of a man a desire to protect. Right. And and so I, it's like in our culture, we've kind of poo-pooed that a little bit too. Uh, women can uh, do so much on their own, but it, it's it's like I think it's the heart of a man. It's a part of the testosterone machine thing going on. And... Uh, Again, I think verbally it helps to honor that, you know, thank you for taking care of me and our family. Mm. You know, when that guy did that, you know, said that rude thing, thank you for standing up and, and talking him down or, or whatever it is, because that's, that's the heart of a, of a guy and that's not wrong. It's, it's different. It's a part of his design and it needs to be honored. And I think the other piece of this is men don't do many things anymore that make us feel masculine. Right. Now, we, we live in the country. My son goes and cuts down a tree and drags it over the house and cuts it up and splits it and takes it inside to keep the house warm, which is important because it gets to zero and below here. He feels like a man when he does that. Most people living in the city, you know, wouldn't know which end of a chainsaw to hold. And if if you're not doing a lot of the things men have traditionally done that make us feel like men, then sex becomes more important because it's one of the few things yeah. that makes us feel manly. Uh, yeah. we, can, we can push that far. Yeah. But that's part of the, the extra drive in there. Yeah, I, I'd like to say something about the whole protection thing, because it brings up in mind two different things about our own marriage. Back when Allie and I had been dating for just a couple of months or so, she had a guy who was calling her and trying to hit on her and such. She had a crush on her for quite a while, and she said, I've got a boyfriend now. Please go away. Please leave me alone. And he wouldn't do it. So her mother said, why don't you give Nick his number and let him deal with him? Mm-hmm. If he calls again, just let, let Nick handle him. So he called again. Ari contacts me and says, here's his number. Can you please deal with him? Okay. I'm at work, but I step outside for a little bit, which is a step to bar. Hello? Ari wants you to stop talking to her. Well, who is this? This is her boyfriend. Uh, I don't know what you're trying to do. I'm a boyfriend. I'm the one she wants. I want you to stop talking to her. Uh, she wants you to go away. She wants her and I to be together. She she wants you to get lost. I wants you to stop talking to her. Mm-hmm. Well, look, why don't we just uh, compare ourselves here? Look, I'm in New York City. I'm working on my bachelor's. What you got? You got nothing. I'm in seminary, and I am working on my master's, and I am at the top of my class. Well... My my father was a detective, and I'll get a res- and I'll I'll get him to to put a restraining order on you. So she said, "Go ahead, do it. I'll have Ali put a restraining order you on you so fast it'll make your head spin." And he hung up after that, but uh, he didn't bother us again. In fact, his father called a couple months, a few months later after we were engaged, even and apologized to me about what Aww. happened, Aww. and. Man, there have been times on Facebook, I think there's an unwritten rule people have on my wall and on her wall. And that rule is that you can say whatever you want to her. You can disagree with her. That's fine. But mm-hmm. if you dare to insert her, stay back mm-hmm. and pop some popcorn. Her husband is going to show up and he will not be satisfied with anything. And honestly, it is the closest I ever get to rage when someone inserts Allie on her wall. So she had someone who did that once, and he was in the military. And after he saw how I was wondering, he said, I am scared of your husband to her. And when I heard that, <laughs> I said, good. I want him to be scared of me. I mean, that, that's part of the whole thing. That's part of a protection drive in us. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Certainly. And, you know, Paul, some of you were talking about, about how sex makes us feel like a man. I think something else a lot of women don't realize for us is that a lot of women don't just don't get into it. It becomes what's called duty sex. And a man will have duty right. sex because it beats nothing. But what pleases a man most, I think, in sex is not what he gets out of it. It's what he gives. If he knows his wife is happy and satisfied and enjoying things, He's walking away the hero from that event. Right. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, duty sex sort of kills the spirit very slowly. Yeah. It just sucks you dry. Yeah. 
And again, that's why I think all these lady bloggers are so important now because they really are carrying marriage, the message that uh, women need to understand what God had in mind for them in sex because sex is for them too. It's just yeah. they're different and they approach it a little differently. We're near the halfway point in our show. Before we get started on another series of questions, I can mind everyone this week we're just talking to Pa and Lori Byerly, both men marriage bloggers, and we'll give you more information on their blogs at the end of the show. If you're listening next week, we're going to have a, a guest on. We're working on the final details, so I'm pretty sure this is going to be our guest. And he's someone I believe I actually found out through Lori's blog. She advertised something of his. He had an ebook just came out, and it's called The Path of Intimacy. Scott Means, who wrote that ebook, is going to be my guest next week on the Deeper Waters podcast. It's going to be an hour-long interview. And it is, this is a really great book to read. Uh, I read it, most of it, in fact. It, it's short. You can read it pretty quickly. I read most some some Sunday night recently here. We we were at some party. There was supposed to be some bird-watching thing going on. I don't know. Something about some superb owl or something of that sort. I didn't understand. Instead, most of us just seemed to turn on TV and watch a bunch of hooligans running into each other for some reason. I I don't know what was going on that evening. I I was hoping to find a superb owl, but I just kept reading this book instead, and it is a great book to read. And he's going to be my guest next week, I hope. But now let's get back to Paul and Lori. Okay, you all have been you have been married for thirty three years. And what would you say are is the big secret? People need to know to have a good and lasting marriage. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I, I would kind of give a two-parter um, answer. And uh, one of them is is just to work to be on, on the same team, to, to have your spouse back, to, to care about um, each other, to value each other. And the other thing is is to deal with your own stuff. We, we all kind into marriage with all kinds of baggage and misunderstanding and wrong belief and always be willing to to challenge that and you know if if i have a problem with fear then i need to read books on it and meditate on scripture on it and see how it's affecting my marriage and ask my husband to team up with me to beat that enemy so anyhow that that would be mine I'd, i'd add too to that generosity and gratitude Mm-hmm. Uh, generosity is, you know, always looking for ways to give to my spouse, to bless my spouse, even when I'm tired, even when I don't think she deserves it for whatever reason. Yep. Ongoing flow of that is incredibly powerful. And the other thing we've learned is gratitude, that just a simple act of, you know, every day when you go to bed, sit down and write three things you're grateful for about your spouse. And that actually changes and can feel very quickly. Yeah, yeah well, I, I agree with the whole gratitude thing. As we are, and I, I think that also speaks for us men, because some we can feel like we do things that don't get really noticed. I mean, a wife, I think, is sometimes take things for granted. A husband goes off all day and does his work and such, provide for family, and some wives don't seem to really realize that. Instead, they're saying they're wanting the exact same thing at home. That I spend all my time cleaning this house. Don't you appreciate me? Yeah. Yeah, expressing gratitude is is important, and we need to do it on the things that happen day in and day out. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't say I don't say thank you once for doing the laundry, and thirty years later I haven't mentioned it again. Yeah, there was the old joke about the wife who was crying one day and says, "We've been married for fifty years, and I just don't know if you love me or not." And he says, "Honey, when I married you fifty years ago, I told you." I love you. And if things ever change, I will let you know. Yeah. <laughs> Very male. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And what difference in, I mean, you you two are Christian bloggers. What difference does Christianity make to this? Um, I think it just brings to the table a set of values. We mm-hmm. hope that we 
bring out, you know, like just something as simple as waiting for marriage to have sex is, is a Christian value. And it, it brings a safeness and a stability to the relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it gives us a great framework. I mean, the Bible gives a framework for you know, being a, a decent person. And then on top of that, for being a decent spouse, you know, what it means to love, what it means to be generous. And so we had that framework already there if we're willing to accept it as, you know, God's truth. You know, I, I did remember what it was I was going to say a while ago, Roy, and it does go with what Paul just said. For instance, I have my own group on Facebook for men who are Christian and just for men and just for Christian men who are married, engaged, dating, or hoping to date and marry, called As Christ Loved the Church. And yes, all you men out there listening, you can ask to join it. And it's a whole group connected to helping us learn how to be better husbands for our wives. And I had originally thought it'd be just for married men, but I thought, why not include the others in there? Because they're warning to, or they're on their way to getting married someday. They can learn from some men who are already there about what to do, what not to do, and such. And one of the things you'd said, Lori, was about having grace for one another and such, and how you have to work on yourselves first. Because so yes. many times, if I feel like Allie has done something wrong to me for a while, I can be sitting there steaming myself, how can she treat me this way? How can she do such and such to me? And then before too long, my theological mind will start working. And I'll say, hey, um, wait a second, Nick. Jesus has done a whole lot more for you. Do you treat him much better than, you, than what you're accusing your wife of doing right now? Uh, okay, yeah. point made. <laughs> I do want to say bless you for having that group because the the power of story is so amazing. And these young men coming along hear the stories of those who are a few steps ahead of them. Yeah. And, and they, they will make far fewer mistakes and, and make some really good steps when they, when they do marry. So bless you for doing that. That's an amazing gift. Yeah. One of the things that made me the happiest in my life is having people come in complimenting me. On marriage and such, in fact, my back, back in my birth on my birthday last year, one of my friends sent me a T-shirt that said, "I love my wife" on it, which is one of my favorites Aww. to wear. I had a friend who got mm-hmm. married a couple about a year and three months or so, year and two months or so ago, and and he was talking, he was asking me, "So Nick, when did you decide you want to marry Allie? It's Like, yeah, I know where this is going, and he said, "I've seen the way you treat her." And I want a marriage like that. But honestly, Aww. the number one thing I like to tell people about is being mm-hmm. at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary's Defend the Faith Conference. I was invited as a speaker. Uh-huh. And Allie and I were together, and we were sitting at this table, and Gary Habermas was there. Gary's very special to us. Me and you know, many people out there know him as one of the world's leading apologists on the resurrection of Jesus. For us, he's been, for Allie, he's been a friend of the family as long as she can remember. For me, he's the guy who introduced me to her and the guy who married us as well. Oh, oh that's neat. We're sitting at a table with him and Tim McGrew, a very good friend of mine, very skilled apologist as well, and several others there. And someone tells this story about B.B. Warfield that when he was on his honeymoon, his wife got struck by lightning. Oh, and oh. She was paralyzed from that day on until the day that one of them died. I don't remember which one died first, but until that day, he never left her side. He was caring for her constantly. And so Gary hears that and says, so Nicholas, would you do that if I have an alley? And I was just stunned for a moment. Do you come the headlights? But Tim jumped in and he said, he absolutely would. Now, I went up to Tim later privately and said, Tim, I, I want to thank you for that great compliment you gave. What compliment? Mm-hmm. The one you said about how if something happened to Allie, I'd absolutely be there. And he said, Nick, you adore Allie, and everyone here can see it. Now, I've told Allie, I said, like, when I was there, I mean, I was invited as an apologist to speak. and said, I got several compliments on that. Yeah, you did. And I got several compliments on being smart, intelligent, things like that. Yeah, you did, honey. I cannot remember a single one of those compliments. Not a one. I remember what Tim said. That's the compliment that sticks with me. Oh, that's very sweet. Yeah. 
You're touching on mentoring, basically. Yeah. And that's something we are huge on. Yeah. If you're if you're newly married, you need a man or a woman mentoring you in marriage. And yeah. I mean, be pushy. Go find someone. We've had people do that with us. You know, will you help us? Yeah. Uh, if you're if you've been married a few years and you have a decent marriage, you need to mentor someone. Yeah. You know, find a find a young kid who's getting married or has just got married. Strike up a friendship. Invite them out for coffee. You know, be in their life, partly to show, you know, I mean, the way you're showing, you know, your love for Allie, anybody who spends time with you sees that. Yeah. Uh, that's good. But then even beyond that, be available to to talk with them, to share with them, you know, when they have problems, to to listen and, and offer some suggestions. Yeah. And I, I think for us, I think we're kind of in a spot in between because we've been married about seven and a half years. So we can go and we can mentor others, some, but at the same time, we could also still benefit from some mentoring. And I suppose no matter how long you've been married, you could always benefit from learning something more. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, you mentioned Scott Mean's book, and that's yeah. kind of the heart of something he says. Wherever you are, there's always a way that you can make your marriage a little bit better. So yeah. whether... So it so you've been married seven plus years, you can love on somebody who's been married one, two, three years and at the same time turn around and hang with people who've been married a few years longer than you have and receive and benefit from them. So yeah. it's all good. Yeah, I, I think one of the things Scott talks about in his book is also something that comes from I believe it's Forgotman Institute, where one of the mm-hmm. things that keeps a couple going is checking for bids. What is a person mm-hmm. saying? And how are you responding? I mean, for me, mm-hmm. I'd say it largely be requests for intimacy and such. That that's a big draw mm-hmm. to me. Or even things like, and I'm actually, Ali, could you please help out with such and such? And to me, it's like, if that doesn't happen, I, in turn, I'm thinking, hmm, I see how I rank here and such. Mm-hmm. And in her mind, she'd be, I just forget, which happens. My mm-hmm. wife has memory issues, so that's understandable. Right. Meanwhile, for her, I think her bids could be something like, hey, do you want to come watch this video here? And even though for me, most of those things are, this is so dumb, I can't believe I'm doing this and such. Usually, I think <laughs> it's 30 seconds of my life. That's uh-huh. not going to be a big deal. Why not just go watch those 30 seconds and have that be it? I mean, of course, I'm not going to lie to her. It's just, well, did you enjoy it? I'm not going to say, oh, that was hysterical. It was wonderful. Like, eh, no, nah, it wasn't my kind of thing. But, you know, I've invested the time at least. Yeah, very good. What do you think also should happen for? Because in every marriage, a little bit of rain must fall. I mean, you all just talk about being at a marriage retreat and having this half-hour discussion that started talking about pants. What should happen when couples argue? Not if they argue, but when they do, because inevitably they will. I think the the trick is learning how to argue well, uh-huh. learning how to be respectful. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned Gottman, and he's done a lot of research on this. And he says a couple who can argue well, even if they argue all the time, will be fine. A couple who argues badly is in trouble, even if they argue rarely. Mm-hmm. And I I think you know that starts with a conversation that says we're going to have disagreements. How do we do that kindly and respectfully? Uh-huh. Um, I think um, one of my favorite tools is a is a book, and it's not a marriage book. It's not even a Christian book. It's called The Third Alternative. It's written by Stephen Covey, and he talks about navigating differences. Mm. Uh, and so, if you if you constantly have disagreements, I would encourage you to read that book because it it helps you sort of back up and talk about the why mm. of what you wanted honoring why you both want what you want and finding other alternatives for satisfying you both. It's, it's a good way to, to navigate differences. But kind of back to your question, yeah, I think it, the heart of it is talking to your spouse and saying, how do we stay kind and respectful? There's a really interesting guy, Dan B. Allender. Uh, he wrote Intimate yeah. Mystery. And he and his wife decided very early on that they would not talk or act with disdain. Mm-hmm. And so if somebody rolls their eyes or somebody starts getting a, a bad edge to their voice, they'll take a break and go calm down and come back and say, how do we have this conversation kindly and respectfully? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they had their differences, too. But but having that means that that you feel heard and uh, respected and and loved. Yeah. The thing about arguments, 
Gottman again says the majority of arguments are perennial. They will never be resolved. Yeah. There are differences that we're never going to see eye to eye. And learning to be gracious in that, you know, and understand, okay, this is a difference. She will always think this way. I will always think that way. You know, how do we best accommodate that rather than, quote, fixing the other person? Yeah. I think one of the things also that there's an example we can argue about that most couples argue about is money. I mean, uh-huh. me, I'm a big guy on saving my money and holding off on things as much as I can. I grew up in a video oh. game culture. Even if I'm playing a video game, I'm saving my resources as much as I can. <laughs> saving as much money. I'll, I'll have an overkill amount of money. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to spend this extra thousand gold pieces or whatever. I mean, I, I, I know I've got one million sitting back there, but I just don't want to risk it, you know? And oh. so when it comes to our budget, I tend to be very tight-fisted sometimes. I do a lot of these free programs to earn gift cards and such and buy things that way. And even then, I'm still stingy some with the Amazon content. And yet, I'm married to a woman who loves gifts and really enjoys going out to eat and such. And I'd say, let's just stay home and fix something on our own. It's cheaper that way and such. And it, it is a perennial thing. I mean, we're never going to stop having these things. And it's going to be a kind of thing where we both have to learn to work with one another's taste when it comes to money. All right. Uh, one resource I highly recommend uh, is Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. Mm-hmm talks about spenders and savers and how to create a budget uh, where both of you sort of have a voice, where Mm -hmm. you save well and you budget in amounts to spend. Mm -hmm. And I have watched, we we facilitated it a few times, and I have watched couples who have really had hard differences really make peace of it and find ways to accommodate both of their needs, you know, to spend and to save. It's a remarkable tool. And I'm sure there are other things out there. This is just one we've done and found it to be really, really helpful for that particular difference. And that actually uh, money is, is like one of the top four things that will bust a couple up, mm. uh, Money, in-laws, sex, and parenting are usually the harder in a marriage. Yes. So, yes, find tools like uh, Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University uh, that can help you navigate those really hard areas. Yeah, in-laws, I think, are another one we should talk about some because I think too often it's mm-hmm. easy for someone in a couple to run to their parents to get uh-huh. advice. Right? And sometimes advice is fine and good, but to weigh in and have them be an arbiter of sorts, mm-hmm. that's when things right. start getting to be a problem. And, you know, if Allie runs to her parents, they're probably more prone to side with her in many cases. Mm-hmm. And my parents are more prone to side with me, and she'd be more prone to defend her parents. I'd be more prone to defend mine. And I think that's one of the reasons mm-hmm. that kind of thing never really works out in I think a lot of in-laws need to learn with their kids' marriage, stay out of it a lot of times. Yeah. Don't interfere. Another factor is, you know, if, if I go to my parents and, and tell about all the problems we're having, then that makes my wife look bad, and yeah. she has to continue leading to them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. I need, I need to guard that to a degree. Mm-hmm. We, um, go ahead, Lauren. That- that we really try and teach people, uh, there is really something to the leaving and cleaving. You leave the family and the culture of the original family, and you get married and you create a new one. Um, and uh, yeah, and as best as you can, surround yourself with people who will support that move, who won't encourage you to run home to mama or or that kind of thing. You you've got to be brave enough to stick it out with your spouse and create this new life together. Yeah, there was a time when we lived in Knoxville and we were in a kind of a tense situation and I was really upset about something. It wasn't me this time, but my mother came <laughs> over and she was not happy and she said something very negative there. It was about her, about Allie, and I said to her, me, I said, Mom, this is my wife, this is the woman I love her, and you are not going to come into my house and speak about her that way. And... I think her parents know the same kind of thing that, yeah, we're going to have our differences and such, but if even they said something really, really wrong that I thought about Allie and that it was hurtful, I'd stand up to them immediately and say, 
You don't talk about my wife that way. Not around me, definitely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's I've, I've seen that. You know, when a when a man fails to stand up to his mother or father, yeah, uh, wife, that is a disaster. Uh, yeah. That not e- easily get healed. Yeah, because a wife wants to know she's the number one woman in his life, and if it looks like his mother is, where well, that's mm-hmm. not going to end well. Yeah. I was so tickled. Our, our, we have a daughter and a son, and our son got married a few years back. And it was really interesting. One of the favorite meals that I used to make for him, I kept my mouth shut. And he chose to love the way his wife cooked that meal. That mm-hmm. became his new favorite meal. Um, and I was, I was so proud of him for uh, creating a new life with her and creating new preferences. Um, and and just the the sense of being loved and appreciated for what she'd done was so great. It was lovely to see. I'd like to remind everyone at this point that you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast and everything we do here is listener supported. And if you want to be a part of that, please go to my website, deeperwatersapologetics.com. There's a link on the side. Help support the work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. And you click on that link and you get taken to the ministry of Risen Jesus. Have you gone to the right place? Yes. Those are my in-laws, Mike and Debbie Lacona. And... You make your donation, you get in touch with me, or Allie, or Mike, or Debbie. You said, hey, I made a donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. There, make sure we get your donation. It will be tax deductible. You can also go on Amazon, buy some ebooks I have either written or co-written, such as A Creed for the Ages, or Defying Inerrancy, Groundless, God and Natural Disasters, Christian Answers, or Risk Generations Questions, and... Uh, Guys, let me tell you about this one here, because in Valentine's Day here, and this this podcast is being recorded the day before, honestly, but, you know, we have it set for Saturdays, so Valentine's Day would have passed, but, guys, if you still want to get something good for your ladies, and there's no rule that says you only do something good for her on holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries. You can do something good all day long. And we've got a lady here. I'm sure she can testify. Jewelry is one of those best ways often to do something for a lady in your life. So we have a jewelry store, actually. My friend Lena Clester handles that. You go and you make a purchase there. And you get in touch with me if you need some help with it and such. Making sure it all goes through that way. Whatever you purchase, 25% of that goes to deeper waters. If you buy a hundred dollar item, we get twenty five bucks from it. So you buy something special, you make your lady happy, and you get support of ministry. So as I like to say, guys, you can buy something special that lady in your life to make up for that big screw up that you recently did with her, or you can buy something special for that lady in your life to make up for that big screw up that I know you're gonna make with her. And if you can't do any of these, please go on iTunes and leave a positive review of a Deeper Waters podcast. I love to hear of them. Now, Paul and Lloyd, do you have any organizations and ministries that you'd like to see people donate to? Yeah, we are, for the last couple of years, completely supported by uh, by the people who support us. I mean, mm-hmm. we're we, this is the only job we have now. Um, you can go to the xycode.com or the-generous-wife.com, and there's information there. Yeah, there's a... Uh donation thing in the right uh, column. So Now, you said another thing that the couples usually fly about, and I and mean, I can't talk about it yet because we don't have any kids yet unless you want to count our little fur baby kitty. That's the only kid <laughs> we have. Uh-huh. Good start. But, yeah. <laughs> but couples do argue a lot about children, don't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that starts with the differences in the way we were raised because yeah. – we assume that's the way it should be done. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I, I, I would say, if nothing else, take a parenting class just so that you have the same vocabulary and the same kind of understandings, then you at least have a starting point for discussion. I, I think I've got a marriage book library on my site, and I have a couple of good parenting books there. But the other thing is, just look around. Who do you see that seems to have a good family life? The kids, I mean, kids are going to be kids, but do the kids look like they feel loved? Do they respect their parents? If so, buddy up with that couple and, you know, talk to us about parenting. Teach us about parenting. What are the resources that helped you the most? That kind mm. of thing. You know, Lori, we just talked about how a man needs to stand up to his parents for his wife. That's so, a mistaken marriage, a man can often be a, overly attached to his mother many times. But uh-huh. the opposite of you know, I think can occur here and it's largely women. I mean men can do this too, but largely it's women. Women can tend to make for children the focus of a marriage many times, can't they? Oh, yeah. uh, and a part of that, um, again, is the female mind. We're very relational. We get pregnant. Our hormones, you know, kind of zero us in on our kids and that sort of thing. And, and again, I think this is the work of older women or of the church in general, where we need to remind new moms that they're still a wife and that yeah. when their children are grown and gone, they're still a wife and they still have that relationship. Uh, you know, you marry for life and you have children for a season Mm -hmm. and you don't want to lose sight of uh, your commitment to be a wife for life. Statistically, the time when a couple is most likely to get divorced is the year after the last child leaves home Mm. because people have, you know, all they've had is the children in common and the kids all leave and they realize I have no idea who this person is and I have nothing in common with them. Right. Uh, And so I, I think that's also a part of why I write the generous wife is because it's that daily reminder that you are married, you know, to build your marriage. So when your kids are gone, you're still married to the love of your life and you, you have a life together instead of having drifted so far apart, you're now married to a stranger and the kids are gone. Why are you there? Hmm. Paul, can you speak about what it is? What's it like for a man when he thinks that the women, the children, I mean, are number one in the, in the ladies' life. I mean, I don't know if you've been there before or not, but you've probably talked with more men who have this kind of thinking, at least. Yeah, it didn't really happen to us, but I've certainly talked to men. And it's it's a tricky thing, because sometimes his wife is, is right where she should be, and he's mm. oversensitive. And mm. sometimes his wife is, is way over the top, uh, and she doesn't see it. You know, oh, you're an adult, you should, you know, leave me alone, and let me take care of the children. So it's a, it's a really tricky thing. You need to sort of get into the, you know, the couple and and the marriage and look at it and, you know, which one of them is being oversensitive here. Uh, But yeah, you see it, the women, you know, basically they neglect their husband because they're so busy with the kids. A lot of people now, the kids are doing too much. Yeah, Yeah, I would say that's kind of an expression of our culture. Uh, We have some, we knew a couple that uh, they had maybe one meal at home a week, dinner time together. The rest of the time, I mean, they were running and running and running. The kids had so many involvements and the parents had involvements. And it, it's like there was there was no couple time and there really wasn't much family time at, at home. And our, our culture just sort of worships busyness and being yeah. involved. And, and yes, you want to be involved in things, but not to the exclusion of your marriage and, and the, you know, building your family life. Yeah. You know, something that you'd said, Paul, also about, you know, maybe sometimes a man could be wrong about things. It's maybe any time, anyway, when a husband or wife says something to one of the other about what they think they're doing wrong and such, maybe in both cases, it's quick to be defensive. I mean, yeah, maybe that spouse could be entirely right, but if it's some of a spouse thinks, it should be taken seriously anyway. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's good for whatever. You know, when I'm criticized, I want to hear if there's any truth in there, even if yep. the person was obviously just trying to hurt me. Yep. Mm-hmm. Or, or you know, if it's that time of the month and the <laughs> wife is kind of going off, it's easy to, to write it off as, oh, she's just being emotional. Well, wait a few days and then talk to her again. And, you know, in the calmer aftermath, hopefully, you know, she can talk about the things that really are bothering her and, and take that seriously. And I know that's hard. It's easy to feel, you know, defensive when someone comes against you or, or says there's a problem or whatever. But that, that's a part of the maturing process and the part of, you know, building that team mentality. We can talk about the hard stuff and still love each other. You know, oh, I, I think part of 
what men go through as well as kids is because this ranks so much in our minds, again, is that sometimes when kids show up, it seems for that time, intimacy goes down. And a lot of husbands, I think, could come to resent that and maybe even see the kids as competition in that area because they're not getting the intimacy they want. Yeah, that is that is sadly um, a fairly significant norm. And again, that's what, you know, kind of the lady bloggers are trying to break into and say, you know, don't lose sight of your marriage uh, with the responsibilities of parenthood. And we do a really job of preparing couples for having children. You know, we tell them, oh, children are blessed. You're so, you know, you're so blessed to have children. Well, yes, they are, but they're hard work. You know, they sleep. refuse to sleep when you're supposed to. They <laughs> interrupt everything in your life. Right. And I think a lot of this could be avoided by talking with couples ahead of time and saying, look, there's going to be, you know, three months that are horrible and six months that are difficult. And then it starts to get better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you know that going in, then you kind of, yeah, I was warned about this. It'll get better. Mm-hmm. And I, I think one of the things that I also hear being told is that it needs to be established that kids need to learn, for instance, that mom and dad's bedroom is off limits. Oh. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, it, it, it certainly there are limits to it. Um, yeah. Some people it's off limits. Some people, you know, you only knock if there's, you know, an emergency. But that definitely needs to be a place where the husband and wife go to be a couple. That doesn't just mean have sex. That means yeah. go to be a couple. That's mm-hmm. the place where they get to go. They can talk openly and honestly. They can, you know, snuggle. They can have sex. Whatever it is they need as a mm-hmm. couple. Yeah. What would you say about that, Lori? Um, yeah, having been a mom and a nursing mom, I think when my infants were little, I kept them in something by the bed. But as they matured, um, as they were able, I moved them into their own room. And it, it is is kind of hard work. Uh, you have to be intentional about the balance. You know, children, it's like their need is immediate. You know, it's like, I'm crying. I need help now. Mm -hmm. Um, And you expect your spouse, your adult spouse to understand that. But if that's all that happens, then your your spouse is always pushed into second place. And uh, that does damage to the marriage. So you have to be really intentional about making the time that you do have available special for them. And yeah, it, it, it's just something I, it's like, even when, when our kids were little and we didn't have much money, you know, we'd tuck them in bed and we'd go sit on the front porch and we, it was in Texas. And so the weather was fine. We could sit and look at the stars and talk and have our time. And, and you just have to be quite intentional about keeping your marriage alive during some of those difficult years with the kid. And a pro tip for the husbands: if the kids knock on the bedroom door, he should be the one to go deal with it. Mm, okay. Because it's, fear for him to take care of it, come back and re-engage with his wife. Yeah. If she goes to take care of it, when she comes back, her brain is still with the kids. That's the way God made her. Not wrong. Yeah. So yeah. guys, you take care of whatever it is. Yeah. I, I remember there was a old joke my wife showed me about a meme that said, if you ever have, says ladies, if you ever have a son, name him Gotham. That way, if he starts crying during the night, you can turn to your husband and say, honey, Gotham needs you. And he will get up without <laughs> any complaining whatsoever and take care of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, and we, oh. they were, we, I've talked about the only kid we've got right now is a fur baby, a little kitty. And so I told Alvin, I said, honey, you're the one who wants the cat most. He's going to be your responsibility. You're going to have to handle things. Well, we oh. got him to our house, our apartment, and he was scared silly at first and ran under our bed that night and wouldn't do anything. And so we thought, well, we're just going to have to go to bed and such. And we are, we're asleep probably around 2.20 in the morning that when we hear, <laughs> <laughs> so myself being a good dude of her husband, I handle this situation properly like any man should. Honey, <laughs> wake up. The baby needs you. <laughs> Uh, uh, to my, uh, to my, I did not mainly for humor. But to my credit, I did get up, and yes, we did take care of him together for about an hour or so, getting him used to his new home and such. And Ben mm-hmm. still managed to get back to sleep. But in, I, I, that, that is, I think, one of the differences, because men can be close to their children, but I don't think we experience the exact same kind of bond that mothers do. 
Yeah, I just I think it's a, a huge difference in terms of how we're made physiologically, and mm-hmm. and it's like kids need both mom and a dad, but but mom have that bonding relational thing going. Yeah. We're, we're also better at switching. You know, we tend to do one thing at a time, and then we go on to something else, and then we leave what we just did behind. Women are more multitasking, and so you know she's here, but her brain's in the last three things she's done. Uh-huh. Hmm. I, I yep. find that interesting because in our family. I'm the one who's the multitasking. I mean, if we sit down to watch something, I've usually got my Kinder or something else out at the same time because I just find it hard to focus on just one thing like that <laughs> and watching one thing. And I like to make the most of my time somehow. And I'm able to do it. I mean, when we got together with my in-laws, when we first got married and such, I'd be sitting there and I'd be playing on a game and they'd be thinking, he is so rude. Here we're trying to talk to him, and he just stuck there playing his game until they realized I was following along with a conversation in Tauri and knew everything was being said. Said, "Well, maybe he is paying more attention than we realize." You're you're very millennial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's odd because I'm 37 actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you're right on the edge of it, but yeah. yeah, I see that. My son is that, that way too. He can do three things at once and do very well concentrated yeah. on all of them. Yeah, yeah. I but, think the thing that you're pointing out here is that that we're not all cookie cutter marriages yeah. and not all cookie cutter people, and I think that's important to note because there there are men who have parts of their brains that are somewhat feminized and women with brains somewhat masculinized. There are, there are men who are all about sex and there are also women who are all about it and, and struggling with husbands who aren't interested. And so we have to be really careful to say this is generally the case by gender or whatever, but there will be exceptions and be willing to kind of walk with people in, in whatever, whatever place they find themselves. You know, it's interesting you talk about the kind of thing about the differences that we have because uh, uh-huh. when it comes to our relationship, that we're, we're actually, since Paul mentioned many other things, we're actually 10 years apart. I'm nearly, I'm nearly 10 years older than she is. But when it comes to the Super Bowl Sunday nights and such, one of us uh-huh. gets really excited about the game and wants to know everything that's going on and watches the TV. The other one of us sits there with a book the whole time and puts it down just to watch the commercials. Guess which one is <laughs> which in our marriage? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Paul's not much of a sports guy either, so I get that one. But, yeah, um, yeah and, I, and that, that again, makes it so important to be a student of your spouse. Because, yes, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, your wife is female in general, but she's going to be a unique individual. And so you need to know all those little things about her. Yeah. Yeah. And vice versa. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about how, since we've talked about this several times of it, it's the other great thing couples fight over, and that's sex. And I'd say when I got <laughs> married, before I was getting married, I was, you'd say, I really don't understand this whole dynamic going on in the that I think that if a couple can be having sex together more often and it makes them so much happier, supposedly. Mm-hmm. Why aren't they doing it more often? And then you get married and you realize, oh, wait, here's a lot of reasons couples aren't engaging as much. Mm-hmm. And and honestly, that's a, a really interesting point because a lot of times sexual issues aren't one thing. They're a bunch of little things that sort of gang up on your life. Mm-hmm. And if you begin to sort of identify what those are and chip away at them a few at a time, then you'll find that it's easier to be more sexual more often. Yeah. I think one of the rules actually given for women who want to work on their libido and having more is actually, if you want to have more, you have to use more of what you've got. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've hit a couple times on use and that, if you don't have enough time together, you don't build intimacy. And for a woman, a lack of intimacy means I don't want to have sex. Mm-hmm. Uh, a guy can come home, he hasn't seen his wife in two days, and he can hop into bed. A woman needs to reconnect. She needs time to, to interface with him non-sexually before she wants to be sexual. And when a marriage is starved for time, that kills it. And doesn't that often lead also to this horrendous back and forth that goes on in so many couples where so many marriages where a wife would say, well, you know, maybe if he helped with the housework and such, I'd be more willing to have sex. But meanwhile, he's sitting there saying, maybe if she was more willing to have sex, I'd be more willing to help with the housework. 
And <laughs> both of them are just using a bargaining chip here. Instead, neither one is asking. But they're both looking at, here's what I think that other person needs to be doing. Instead of saying, geez, what do I need to be doing? Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, deal with your own stuff. Mm-hmm. The other thing is when we're talking to a group, we always tell, we say the more mature person should go first. And so <laughs> anyhow, you get a lot of volunteers, I'll go first because they want to be seen as more mature. Um, but yeah, definitely deal with your own stuff. Be the one willing to to take the first step in, in healing whatever breach there is. Mm-hmm. And why do you think it is or what cuppers do fight so much when it comes to the area of sex? I mean, for us men, for instance, I think we're looking at saying, you know, free fun, and we get to have an intimate connection. Why would we not want to do this more often? Um, I, I can't speak so much for the guys, but I can the gals. There's a lot of baggage mm-hmm. in our culture that we get you know, thrown on our shoulders. I just listened to... Um, sex chat for Christian wise, I guess there was a whole talk on the me too thing. And every last one of the gals who was talking had been, if not sexually abused, at least harassed. And they talked about how that that impacted how they saw themselves, how they saw sex. And it it is, you know, body image issues, sexual harassment, and just things like um, sex is is sort of easier in a physical sense for guys. I mean, all your is on the outside and you can see it all, all ours or most of ours is internal or harder to see and women are taught to be more chaste and and often in christian circles that means you don't think about sex or you don't this so when you get married you're starting at zero or maybe even negative 20 and guys are out running far ahead they're at 112 man and they're going full steam and and so you get this huge mismatch in terms of how do you approach sex mm-hmm. and a- Horrible lack of understanding, you know, yeah. a couple gets married and, you know, two weeks in the guy walks out of the bathroom with an erection figuring, well, that, you know, she's going to get turned on and jump me because that's what I would do. Well, she was tested and that just totally freaks her out and she's not having sex the rest of the week because of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he didn't mean to, to hurt her to push her buttons, but he did because he didn't understand her reality. Yeah. And I think a lot of it does have to do with the negative messages the church gives. I mean, I, I've told about this before. There was a time when I was in Bible college, and I went to my church, and there was a silver ring thing going on, right. and the asso- which for those who don't know is kind of a true love waits thing. And yes, I support that kind of message. But the associate mm-hmm. pastor got up, and he was giving a talk, and he was saying, now I want you all to know, if you have sex before you get married— you will be doing it for selfish reasons. And I was like, okay, I can agree with that. And he's talking about, what if you get pregnant? What if you get an STD? Think about the shame that you will face on your wedding night when you have to tell someone else that you're not a virgin. Things of that sort and such. And I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, um, Pastor, I'm sorry, but those sound like pretty selfish reasons to me as well. And there was hardly anything said about joy. If even just lip service was paid to it. And I'm sitting back here listening to this, and I am getting bored. And what I tell people is, look, if you are talking about sex, and you have a college-age guy in the audience, and he is getting bored, you are doing it wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Yeah, there's a a total lack of it's going to be great. Um, Yeah. There's a fear that if we admit that sex is good, then kids will go out and do it. Mm-hmm. The fact that we know that, we don't have to tell them. They already know that. Mm-hmm. You know, what I want to do is tell them that married sex is incredible, but what you do before can mess that up. Yeah. So there is a reason to wait. And it's not because, you know, God's going to come and slap your hand. I mean, yes, it's wrong. But the reason to wait is so that when you get married, you have a really good sex life. Yeah. And I mean... I I think that when it comes to is that it's again the men and women do approach things in an entirely different way. One of the things we just talk about and you two might have something interesting is that when a couple of fights, what a woman doesn't understand, sometimes when a fight's done, a man will pretty much want to have sex immediately when it's done. And the woman's saying, We just had a big argument. Why do you want to have sex right now? And the thing is, mm-hmm. for the guy, he's sitting there thinking we just had a big rupture, a big rift between us, and sex is often a way of telling us, you're okay, 
well, okay, we're going to get through this. A woman doesn't see that. Mm -hmm. It's reconnection for a guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know women will often resist sex because we see it as everything's okay. Yeah. Uh, And everything's, if everything's not okay, she doesn't want to convince the guy it's okay. Mm. And I think the, the answer to that is, you know, I'm going to make love of you because I care about you, but we still have problems that we have to work through. Right. What would you say to couples who are struggling with this area? Mm. Um, probably uh, get educated. You know, follow a few blogs. Uh, TheMarriageBed.com has a forum where you can uh, anonymously go in and ask questions and talk and get help. Uh, some of the, the sexual problems that a couple will have will be a lack of knowledge. I had a, a little gal email me one time. She was panicked half to death. I can't satisfy my husband. You know, every night when he's asleep, he'll get an erection and I'm obviously not satisfying him. Well, she didn't know that that's a common thing that happens during a dream cycle. Yeah. And that, that's a part of, uh, of, you know, male health. And once I told her that it was like, oh, everything's okay. It's normal. <laughs> um, you know, so some of the problems that couples have is just a lack of knowledge. And some of it is is relational stuff and talking with the, the, the power of community is amazing. And so that's why, you know, I love the Mary Bed Forum where you can go and talk and hear others sort of navigate the same problems. Uh, there, there is an increasing number of good resources in blogs and books. It used to be very difficult to write anything on sexual information uh, from a Christian perspective, but... Uh, as the years have passed, it's gotten better and better. Sheila Gregor has uh, a number of good books on sexuality. And you mentioned Jay of Hot, Holy, and Humorous. Probably the best thing, you know, if if you have a good mentor couple uh, that you can talk with. And there are also some, some courses out there now, a group called AwakenLove.net, I think. I think it's .net. It has a video course. They've done it in person for years. Now they've got a video course. It's a six-week course for women, basically helping them to see sex the way God intended. And it's absolutely incredible material. You know, it's the kind of thing you get, you know, half a dozen women together uh, and go through it, you know, for six weeks. And it has an amazing effect on how those women see sex, how they think about sex. And there is a follow-up course for the guys. The gals are supposed to do the course first and then wait a couple weeks. I don't think the guys is out in video yet. Oh, it's not. Okay. Okay. And there there are other courses out there. I mean, it's just, it's exploding. The Christian... Unity has finally figured out sex is important and we should do something about it. You know, Lori, you talk about these misconceptions we have. I mean, are, are you seriously telling me that if I grew up watching sitcoms and movies and such and I see all these sex scenes that when I get married, you know, things aren't actually going to work the way they work on TV? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's so many things in our culture, movies, there's porn, there's erotica, there's, and, and just the stuff kids talk about in the locker room and among friends, uh, so much misinformation. Um, and that's why I say education is so important uh, because our, our expectations are formed by our culture and our culture has missed it by a mile, maybe yeah. several miles. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, something that someone even, uh, so I'm so even say something about watching these shows such yeah, you know it's not real when there's never even any mess to clean up afterwards. I mean right. cops don't even keep right. a towel nearby or anything. Yeah, I distinctly remember having a conversation with uh, a group who said something about just having little hand tails, hand tails by. And then there was a single person and they looked very confused, like towels? Why do you need towels? <laughs> and I'm going, honey, get married, have towels on hand, go figure it yeah. out. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and I think another big myth that we uh, that we give to people is, again, this comes from media that, you know, everything just goes naturally and such and your your wedding night if you wait and such you are going to be sent to the moon and back and many <laughs> couples are going to say you know it was good it was special but the first time is usually not the best time ever right yeah we did try and warn people that it's like anything else you're going to be awkward the yeah i mean when you learn to ride a bike you don't do it perfectly the first time you you fall over a few times <laughs> yeah if Lori and I have never been dancing and we decide to start dancing together, 
we may have fun, but it's not a good dance. You know, I step on her toes, she slips. You know, we, if we approach it as we'll get better over time, then we can laugh about it. If we think it's supposed to be a perfect waltz the first time, we're going to be badly disappointed. disappointed. Yeah. yeah. You know, oh, I think something that a lot of women get wrong, and I like Lori's in this too, is that they look at what a man or desire sex. Like, all a man wants is physical release. That's, mm-hmm. you know, a man does want that, but. The man wants a whole lot more that he gets from the sex than just physical release, doesn't he? Yeah, I saw a study recently that found the majority of men wanted more snuggling, mm-hmm. uh, which was not surprising to me, but most women find that surprising. The The problem is a lot of men are living on a starvation diet of sex. Yeah. Uh, and that makes it difficult to feel the rest of it because like, if I hadn't eaten for a week and you want me to go – you know, get all dressed up and go to a fine restaurant and, you know, wait, you know, for the, the crackers to come and the bread to come. And it's like, no, I'm starving. I'm going to grab the first thing I see and stuff it in my mouth. And when a guy is working on that level sexually, then he can't appreciate the rest. Yeah. Doesn't mean he doesn't want to. He just can't. Yeah. You know, I, I have to say, I, I kind of get surprised when I read marriage blogs and I could, Sheila's even, and I says, men invest in foreplay more. And I'm sort of thinking, why would a man not want to do this? I mean, this is more time you get to spend with your wife enjoying her body and everything else. Why would you not be wanting to do this? Well, again, the starvation. If 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 you are desperate, then all you can think about is getting to the release. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're not desperate, then yeah, it's it's why wouldn't I want to spend more time? Mm-hmm. Lloyd, what do you think about all this? I mean, do you think that men are just wanting a release or what? Oh, I, I think men are people too. Um, I don't think they're just, you know, sex monsters or whatever. I, I think our culture has set us up very badly. And, and so frequently in marriage, you have guys who are very sex hungry. And, and that just makes the relationship different difficult and i think again that's why all these bloggers and books are so important because we're we're trying to help people see it differently and undo some of the damage you know deal with some of the baggage and it you know it breaks my heart because not only is a low sex or no sex marriage hard on the guy it's hard on the gal she may not know it god created her with a sex drive too and a need for that level of intimacy and typically both partners have some kind of brokenness that's making it hard for them to to fix that area and other areas of their marriage so yeah so that's why that's a a part of why we do what we do to help these couples through some of these problems i think it's something biblically to realize is that you will marry a sinner i mean something i've told you before is that (laughs) even if jesus i don't think he was but even if jesus had been married jesus would not have had a perfect marriage because he would have been right. married to a sinful woman. So if right. Jesus could never have had a perfect marriage, it's pretty <laughs> ludicrous to think the rest of us are going to manage somehow manage to pour it off. Right. Yeah. I think I think uh, as you grow and as you learn, you can create a marriage that feels safe mm-hmm. and that um, that you can address problems. But I don't think you run out of problems. Yeah. I think you get better sometimes. I think you solve some problems and you get better at dealing with others. Um, yeah. So yeah. Well, we're getting near our final segments mm-hmm. here. Um, Lori, what's the final message you would like to give to husbands and wives out there? Um, that, that marriage has incredible worth and it's worth the time and energy to build and grow a good marriage. I would say take a good look at your time use and get rid of the things that don't matter so that you have time to to invest in your marriage. Uh, marriage can be an incredible, incredible blessing, and it's worth working for. And, Paul, what would you say to husbands and wives out there? Well, she just covered all of it, really. <laughs> uh, I mean, a, a good marriage is difficult. It takes work. There are, there are times when it's stressful. It is so worth it because a great marriage – is really one of the best things that we will have this side of heaven. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's enough time to get into another question, so I guess it's time to start wrapping things up. Uh, I know you all do have them, so blogs, websites, emails, ways people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more. Uh, probably the websites is the quick, easy way because there's contact forms there that will get to us by email. Mm-hmm. So for me, xycode.com 
And for me, the-generous-life.com. I've been writing so long. I started my blog back when people had dashes in them. And so, yeah. And also, if you just if you just Google Paul and Lori Byerly, our blogs will come <laughs> up too. So, and Do you have any yeah. final messages you'd like to leave today for the Deeper Waters audience? Um. I just I'm I'm impressed. Well, I I really I took a peek at your blog and the different things you do, and I just love it when people uh, want to grow and learn and challenge what they believe. And and so it um, it's nice to talk to an audience of of people who are thinkers and love to explore ideas. Mm, very good. To hear. I would say, Paul, God says that marriage is a way of seeing how He loves the church. It is mm. a uh, a worldly representation. And so it's important that our marriages look good because they're communicating something to people about God's love and it may or may not be what we should be communicating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming on. Hope we we'll see you back here again sometime. Okay. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Nick. I like money when back next week. Hopefully we're going to have Scott Means on talking about the path of intimacy. For now, I'm Nick Peters and I'm signing off. <laughs>